we are here to listen to David Lang. And uh, this is the last session for the day for our September 2021 Accordance E Academy. We hope that you've been able to participate in other sessions. If not, we will post videos soon. But uh, David Lang is here to talk about a uh, particular accordance title that he's had a direct hand in working on, and that's our uh, Bible Times Photo Museum, which is now in its third incarnation. Now, a little bit about David, if you don't know, he's got the record, I think, as being with accordance longer than anyone else. He's uh, besides the founders, I suppose, but he's been with accordance since 1995. That makes him an accordance veteran. He's authored or co-authored Accordance's Bible Lens Photo Guide and Bible Times Photo Museum, as well as the book Max in Ministry and six volumes of Northland Church's Journey to Spiritual Maturity series. And he likes to say that his dirty little secret is that Accordance makes him look much smarter than he is. And that's true for all of us. So uh, we hope that uh, you'll enjoy this session. There are some, there are, there is one handout uh, available that you should be able to download in your uh, go to meeting controls. And we encourage you to ask questions. We'll try to answer some of those questions as we go. And we will also, um, uh, if any particular questions that only David can answer, we will pose those to him at the end. So David, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thank you, sir. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, coming out virtually to uh, to take a look at the photo museum. This has been my baby for um, probably better part of, of a decade now. And uh, so I'll sort of start out telling you a little bit about, um, about how I ended up coming to write the photo museum and then we'll we'll dive into showing you how to um, how to use it, some of the new material. And uh, I'll also uh, share a lot of tips on how to get the most out of not just the photo museum, but any accordance module that has images. Um, I'll show you some some tips and tricks that, that you may not know about. So um, my my writing for accordance um, probably goes back uh, as early. Well, I guess as early as 1997, 1998, um, I had ghost written some books for um for the pastor of a church and that's was that uh, uh six books that rick was talking about and so i had had a writing background and we were working on the accordance bible atlas and uh, uh the atlas was was so far ahead of its time um just to think that we released it in 1998 it's hard to hard for me to get my head around but um when we were developing that, it occurred to us, you know, we've got all these site names on the atlas. It would be helpful to have some kind of resource that would explain uh, what, you know, these different locations are. Uh, everybody knows Jerusalem and Nazareth and Bethlehem, but, uh, but you know, who knows Akko, for example. So, um, so I was tasked with writing a little tool that gets included with the Accordance Atlas. Um, you, if you own the Atlas, you have this tool, although you've probably never looked at it or realized that you have it. But it's called the Dictionary of Place Names. And, um, and it's basically just a, a, a series of short articles about uh, different biblical locations. And that was included with the Atlas and has been um, released with the Atlas ever since. Well, a few years after that, um, the founders of the company had uh, had done some traveling and spent um, time in Israel, lived in Israel, and so had all kinds of photographs um, that they had taken of Israel. And uh, and they came to me and said, you know, it'd be great to expand this tool and add photographs of each of these sites. And so um, here here are thousands of photographs. Um, go. Uh, go add them to uh, your place names dictionary and, and let's create something uh, that we later decided would be called the photo guide. So this is the, um, in, on, on the screen here, we've got the dictionary place names and then um, this is the photo guide. So for the same entry, you can see the articles, not much different, but we've added some Greek and uh, we've uh, added photographs. 
So um, the photo guide was was a really fun project for me to work on. Um, it was very challenging because I had never been to Israel myself. And uh, so I'm looking at all of these photographs of places I've never been and trying to figure out, okay, you know, is this pile of rocks that I'm looking at a, you know, Old Testament period pile of rocks or is this a Byzantine period pile of rocks or, uh, or what is this? And uh, so, and that was really, um, before Google and uh, and uh, all the resources that are available now online, so so I was buying every you know tour guide book I could find and Bible dictionary and and whatever I could find to try and identify the items in these photographs. So it was it was difficult work, but it was it was incredibly rewarding work because I ended up learning more about the Bible working on that project than. Uh, I ever did in seminary, and that's not a knock against seminary. My seminary experience was great, but uh, it was just a deep dive into the world of the Bible. So fast forward a few years, um, eventually I moved on to uh, other projects, and um, a fellow named um, James Davis started working on the photo guide and and uh, really expanding it, and now we have five or six different photo guides with the photo guide overview that sort of links them all together. Um, and around that time, um, my employers came to me again and said, you know, we've got all of these photographs of, of objects, of artifacts uh, in all of these museums that we've been to and, and as well as, you know, um, even at the sites that, that we go to, you know, there are um, sometimes inscriptions and, um, and artifacts that are there at the site. We've got all these photographs. It'd be great to have a resource that would do for all of those artifacts what we've done for place names um, with, the, with the photo guide. And uh, eventually that's what turned into um, the Bible Times Photo Museum. So you have the Bible Lands Photo Guide you have the Bible Times Photo Museum, which is more focused on objects. So, for example, here's here's the Photo Museum. This isn't a new article, although it's been expanded with some new pictures. But um, you know, it's kind of a typical article illustrating the the, the core idea of the Photo Museum that um, there are objects and artifacts and tools and implements that were used by ancient peoples. Uh, let's show those photographs and talk about them and, and explain them. So, uh, you know, here's uh, the warrior base from Mycenae, and you can see um, the panoply of, uh, of um, pieces of armor that were worn by, um, by Aegean warriors. And... Uh, then a, um, a more sophisticated wine jar that, uh, from a later period in, in Greek art that, that shows the same thing, a, a soldier with all of the implements of his armor and so on. And then, you know, as you scroll through, you get to uh, specific elements, so um, shields, and these are long shields that were used by Assyrian archers and, and so on. So uh, you've got all of these photographs that you can learn uh, all about um, armor. And of course, once you've uh, begun exploring armor through uh, these artifacts, uh, that sort of led to other articles. Um, I've got to move my go to meeting controls so I can see it, but um, articles on warfare. So this. Uh, this article sort of attacks uh, the issue of warfare from a different angle um, and will incorporate some of those same pictures of arms and armor, but um, this article is more focused on, um, on military techniques, Assyrian siege camps, um, and uh, the Roman camp at Masada. Um, let me go ahead and click on some of these images so you can see them. Um, this is actually uh, from the movie Masada. Um, so this is the uh, the movie set that was created. And uh, well, there's there you've got the movie set and so on. 
So, um, so that was kind of the, the core idea of the photo museum. That's, that's how it started. And uh, I will, um, so one of the, the primary uses for the photo museum, um, besides as a, a great source of information, is as a, a source for photographs. And uh, same with the photo guide. Uh, if, um, if you're a Sunday school teacher or you're a preacher creating sermon slides or, or whatever, um, this kind of material makes great um, illustrations. If I were talking about um, the, uh, the invasion of Sennacherib in Isaiah or in Kings, um, these are reliefs depicting that particular invasion and uh, the siege of the um, Judean city of Lachish. So I might want to use this, um, this image in uh, my slideshow or, um, or if I'm teaching directly from accordance, I might want to use this image. So, um, so what are some ways that you can do that? Well, first, um, when you click on a photograph, you get this preview window. And this is true of any accordance tool with, um, with photographs or images. And um, I can't really do much with this preview tool except um, I can click the arrows and go from photograph to photograph, etc. So I can kind of quickly scroll through photographs until I find the one that I want. Um, I can copy directly from this window. Um, but if I want something more permanent than this, if I, if I click off of it, it's, it's gone again. So if I want something more permanent, um, I can go down to the controls down here and click uh, this little diagonal arrow, and it will pop uh, that photograph into a, um, a separate uh, tab. And uh, so, you know, if I wanted a couple of pictures, I can click that and then click that arrow again. And notice each of these tabs has recycling turned off because the assumption is that you want to uh, have multiple pictures. You may want to create your own slideshow here. So, uh, so you can go through and you can uh, find the pictures that you want and, uh, and collect them in separate tabs. Um, most of you have probably figured that out, but uh, the... The thing I want to show you is there's a cool shortcut that you can use, which is simply to hold down the command key on uh, Mac or the control key on Windows and click the thumbnail of an image and notice that image automatically got added to uh, my picture zone with these different picture tabs. So I can go through an article and I can say, okay, well, I want that. I want that, I want that, and, um, and now I've got, uh, in very short order, I've collected uh, five different images that I can use. All right, so uh, this is the kind of thing that I would do whenever I was teaching Sunday school. I would teach directly from accordance, and, uh, and I'd just um, collect the photographs that I wanted ahead of time, and then I might, you know, open up the, uh, the text that I wanted. Let me drag that over there. And uh, I'm going to take this entire zone of um, pictures, and I'm going to drag it into the same zone with uh, my text. So um, you can see I've, if I drag it here, it's going to create a new zone and just sort of move the pictures over. But if I, if I hit the right spot, so that I get that little square there. Uh, that will add all of these, this entire zone of tabs to my Bible text zone. And I'll now have a single zone with a bunch of tabs. All right, so um, let's see, here's my text. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take this zone. Let's just close it for now. So once I've, um, oh, why isn't that closing? Am I just missing the, there we go. Uh, I guess I just missed the X. Um, so this zone that 
once I've mined my photo museum for photographs, um, I'll just get rid of the photo museum zone and um, I'll put all the pictures in the same zone with my text. And what I would do is I would, you know, as I'm working through the text, um, I might go to uh, each of these. I could zoom in uh, ahead of time to make sure that they're sized properly. And uh, then I'll just cycle through the photos when I want them. All right. So I might, you know, read five verses and then say, okay, this is the, the image that I want and, and so on. Another little tip if you're doing something like this is you can click the little arrow in the in the tab and you can rename the tab. So I might call this, you know, torture of prisoners as that's what the Assyrians are doing here to these poor guys. They're probably flaying them alive. Um, and so by giving, by renaming the tabs, I've got a more helpful label that I can use to go to the right picture at the right time. The other advantage of having all of this in one zone, um, so the reason that I dragged all these pictures into the same zone as my text, uh, one reason is, is simply when I want my class to focus on the text, I want them focusing on the text, not looking at the pictures that might be over on the side in another zone. Um, but the other reason is that you can use the slideshow feature of accordance. And we'll see how this works with the webinar. Um, but the slideshow feature will basically create a slideshow out of a workspace with a single zone. And I've got my little uh, slide uh, resource here so I can go and choose a particular picture or I can go back and forward and uh, and so on. So um, so slideshow mode's nice because it gets rid of all of those uh, controls and menus and buttons that can also distract uh, your audience. And when you're done, just um, hit the stop button or you can hit escape on your keyboard and you'll go back to uh, the regular um, accordance workspace. All right, so um, so those are some tips for how I would organize um, these images that I'm mining from the photo museum um, in an accordance zone and present directly from accordance. What if I want to present from, um, from something like a, a slideshow program like PowerPoint or Keynote? Well, here's another um, little trick um, let's let me go I'm gonna um, I'm gonna get rid of all these picture tabs now and a, another little tip is that if I hold down the option key and um, which I think is the alt key on on Windows if I hold down the option key or the alt key and then click the close icon for the tab that I want to keep it will close all the other tabs uh, so that, that's another kind of quick way to get rid of stuff that once you're done with it. And um, I'm going to go to um, First Peter. And um, here we have Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, etc. So let's say that I'm preaching a um, sermon on First Peter. And... I um, want to illustrate that. So I've set up a keynote slideshow here, and um, it's just, you know, here's my title slide, and then I've got um, the Apostle Peter. Okay, who was Peter? I want to illustrate that with some kind of image that represents Peter. And then um, there's the phrase elect exiles. Well, you know, is there an image that I can use to illustrate the idea of exiles? So um, I'm going to go to the photo museum and um, let's just open the photo museum up here. And um, in terms of finding a, an illustration of Peter, you know, I might try, well, is there an article on Peter? And there's not. Um, so the photo museum does not uh, cover Peter specifically. But one of the new articles that I think you're going to want to mine for um, images is an article I've entitled Portraits. 
And uh, hey, David, can you make your table of contents a little bit larger in the settings? Yeah, sure. Let's see. Um, uh, Sorry. That, no, down that below is... there where it says table of contents, library font size, you've got it on medium, small. You're right oh, there, okay. right there. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And you can tell how much I adjust that. All right. Now I can actually see the word portraits. Um, so um, that's what I was looking for. So this is one of the new articles in um, the Photo Museum 3. And um, I can see myself using this quite a bit. Um, and I dedicated an entire article to um, essentially covering the Fayum uh, mummy portraits. These are um, mummy portraits that were, so in Egypt in Roman times, in the Roman period, a little before um, the turn of the, um, uh, from BC to AD, and uh, up through about the third, fourth century, you had wealthy Egyptians that uh, were still being mummified. And um, what they would do is they would have their portraits painted on wood and um, on these wood panels that would then be um, placed on the mummy and sort of wrapped with the mummy. So you can actually see uh, this is an image of the mummy portrait um, in a cartonage um, mummy case. And uh, you can see it looks, um, it's very striking. It looks like the deceased is actually peering out of a window in the, um, uh, in the coffin and looking at you. And these are, um, because these were meant to be realistic portrayals, because they're not uh, particularly idealized, and they've actually verified this by scanning the, uh, the mummies um, and uh, x-raying them and discovering that structurally um, they, uh, these are true representations of these people's faces. So um, this is the closest thing that we have to actually seeing what people in, um, in the ancient Near East looked like. And um, so that's interesting from, a, um, from an aesthetic standpoint. It's, it's also, um, I think, going to be very useful for uh, if you need an illustration of Peter, for example, you know, I might say, all right, well, you know, that, that could be Peter, or let's see, who do I, who do I want? If I wanted to represent Peter as a younger man, um, I might do something like that, or, um, or here you have a, a middle-aged man. So I might decide, okay, well, there's my Peter. Um, that's, that's what I imagine um, Peter looking like. So I want to add that particular image to my to my keynote slideshow um, where I have that that image drop zone. So here's my uh, my keynote um, slideshow. I'm going to go here, and this is a drop zone that I can drag an image onto, and it'll replace this this placeholder. So um, one trick in uh, using accordance with with images is if you grab the thumbnail and drag it, I'm going to drag it to the Keynote icon in my dock, and that's going to drag it there. That will take me to Keynote, and now I can drop it right there, and it'll um, put that image uh, onto my picture. And I can then say, well, let's uh, let's double click this and um, and we can adjust the the frame and and so on. So I can get this looking exactly the way I want it, but um, but that's a nice little shortcut that I can grab the thumbnail and drag it right onto my keynote slideshow. So um, so let me talk a little bit more about the the Fayou mummy portraits. Another reason that I thought it was important and important to include a bunch of them. Normally, we don't 
normally we try to illustrate um, something with two or three images, um, not uh, in this case. I think we have 30 different different portraits uh, in the Photo Museum 3. But because these uh, are really the only uh, images that we have of what ancient peoples looked like, um, the Fayum mummy portraits get talked about quite a bit uh, today as um, you have um, discussions of race, and so you'll have discussions of, well, you know, what did Jesus really look like? What did the Jewish people really look like? What did ancient Egyptians really look like? What was their uh, skin tone and ethnicity and all of that? And uh, and I talk about in the article, you know, it's um, it's pretty hard to to pin any of that down because, of course, Egypt was a cosmopolitan society that was ruled by Romans and Greeks and Persians for hundreds of years before this period. Um, so it's hard to know exactly, are these people native Egyptians? Are they, uh, are they of Greek descent? Are they uh, Roman and so on? Um, but uh, anyway, um, this is where people turn when they have those discussions. And so I wanted to represent as broad a range of, of faces and skin tones and um, male and female and young and old and so on. So you've got a number of of images here that that can be used to illustrate uh, ancient peoples. All right. So that's the uh, the portraits article, um, which I think is uh, is great. Um, this one, even though this is a fragmentary, uh, very fragmentary image, um, this lady uh, was obviously wealthy, and there's just something about her um, that looks very imperious to me. And so uh, I have used this image uh, for my YouTube channel. Um, I do Bible teaching um, uh, videos, and I've done a couple on um, Ahab and Jezebel. And I've used this image to represent Jezebel. Um, and uh, so all my thumbnails uh, feature this poor woman's face. It was probably quite lovely, and and I've uh, I've turned her into Jezebel. But uh, but anyway, um, these kinds of Images are really useful that way. All right, so um, in my Peter slideshow, I also wanted uh, an image of exiles, right? The next slide is uh, explicating this idea that Peter is writing to the elect exiles in um, in Asia Minor. So I need something to to illustrate exiles. So I'm going to um, search for this. And uh, so I'm going to go to captions. And so I've just changed my, my search field to captions. And uh, I'm going to search for exile. And let's see what we get. All right, so um, I've got eight hits um, and one other trick that, that I want to show you um, in using the photo museum as a source for images is uh, one of the great features of Accordance is that you're not restricted or confined to uh, viewing a book the way that the book was actually written and laid out. So um, if, I, if I scroll, um, I can see, all right, well, this is this image is under the Battle of Carchemish. Um, you can see that down here in the go-to box. And I could also open up the uh, um, open up the table of contents and see, okay, it's under Babylonians, under the Neo-Babylonian Empire, Battle of Carchemish. And what's the Battle of Carchemish? Well, you can read about it. But, um, but it found this image of, of exiles and I can, uh, click the hit button to see other images. Let's see if we get any that are different than this. Um, okay, so we get coins of Herod Archelaus that mention that he was removed from office and sent into exile. And um, this is a um, silver amulet inscribed with the Aaronic blessing. Um, it dates from the period just before the Babylonian exile. So, um, these images are more or less related to, to exile. And um, as I go hit to hit, several of these are the same image. 
All right, so um, so you can use the the hit buttons to go back and and scroll through these images as you're searching for images. But another thing, you know, or, or I can scroll through and see those images in context. But if I'm trying to mine the photo museum for images, one um, one thing that makes it uh, really easy to use as a as a kind of image tool, uh, image catalog, is to go to the um, gear menu up here in the corner of the uh, of the pane. And if I click on that, I can um, go to show text as, and I can choose how I want the text displayed. Do I want the entire text of, of the photo museum displayed? Do I want only the articles that were found as the result of a search? If I choose articles here, notice it gives me the, the Battle of Carchemish as the first article that contains a um, the word exile in the captions field. All right, and then as I scroll, it'll show me that whole article. But um, then we get to Herodian coins. So it's skipped all the other articles that didn't have a hit, and here is my hit under Herod Archelaus. So uh, I've just gotten rid of a lot of intervening material so that it's much easier to scroll through um, and find what I'm looking for. But I can go even, um, even further and do show text as paragraphs. And this will just give me the paragraph that has the word that, um, that I search for. So this is basically just going to give me the paragraphs that contain the pictures that I want and the, the captions. So I can now scroll through and I'm just seeing those pictures. That's all I'm seeing. Um, I don't have any real context except in the uh, go-to box, it'll, it'll show me what article I'm in. Um, or I can, if that's too, too narrow and I want a little bit of context, well, where did these, where did these come from? I can do show text as add titles. Add titles basically means that it's going to show me my hit paragraph and it's going to add the title paragraph. So I have Battle of Carchemish and then my picture. And then I have coins, Herodian coins, coins of Herod Archelaus. So, um, so that's a nice, nice little shortcut for um, when you want to search the photo museum for images. So if I wanted to do something like weapons, um, this is with the add titles displayed. So it's showing me games and sports, gladiatorial combat, and then uh, here's a helmet. Then it goes to Philistines. So let's just do show text as paragraphs. And now I can uh, scroll quickly and find images of weapons, right? Or I could say, well, maybe specifically I'm looking for swords. And uh, so I can find a relief of close combat with swords. I find um, uh, something that just happens to mention swords but shows axes. Uh, here's bronze daggers and swords, etc. So I can quickly scroll through and go, okay, well, I'm talking about Greek stuff, and that looks like a Greek sword. So let's um, let's use that image, right? Or I might want to talk about how um, swords were cast. And here's a mold for casting swords and so on. All right, so um, that's another, um, another tip for mining the photo museum as a source of images. Um, change the way that you display the text, and you can very quickly uh, find the images that you're looking for. All right, so... Um, We've talked about the photo museum as a, as a catalog of images, and there are all kinds of images that, um, that you can explore. There are 1,300 unique um, images in the, in the photo museum three. That's 350 more than, than were included in the photo museum two, and uh, about twice as many as the original photo museum. And those photos are all linked some, uh, 2,400 times. Um, so some photos uh, I use for multiple articles and, and so on. So um, 
so that's the photo museum as a, a source of images that you can that you can mine the other way that um, that I think you'll find the photo museum to be really helpful um, a way that you'll use it a lot is as a companion to the timeline so um, let me do this I'm just gonna do um, Let's just search for David. And um, I'm going to um, just select David. And uh, let's say I'm, um, I'm teaching through 1 Samuel or Ruth or, or whatever, and um, I find the name David. And uh, I click on the timeline button. And there are lots of Davids um, on the timeline, but I want the original uh, David. And uh, so I have um, David on the timeline. Well, as I was working on the photo museum, um, it, it occurred to me uh, after I'd started working on all these articles about um, the various artifacts and things that, well, you know, we're sort of missing an opportunity here if we don't make the photo museum uh, function with the timeline in the same way that the photo guide functions with the atlas. Uh, with the atlas, if I open up the atlas, if you make the um, if you make the photo guide your default tool from the atlas, you can hover over a place name, and if you look down in the instant details, you'll see information about that site, but you'll also see a preview of the article in the photo guide overview on Jerusalem. And if I double click, it'll open up the photo guide article on Jerusalem. And now I've got lots of information about Jerusalem and, and photographs. All right. So, um, so hopefully, you know, you're using the, uh, the photo guide as your default resource from the Atlas because it's a, it's a great resource to get more information about all these sites on the Atlas. And in, in thinking through that, I started thinking, well, why don't we make the photo museum uh, do serve the same purpose for the timeline? And that was especially um, important back before our um, uh, last year's upgrade to the timeline, because if you, if you notice uh, I'm hovering over David or if I, um, if I click on it, you'll get the information about David. And prior to the, um, the expanded timeline that we released last year, all the information that you would see was this. So you'd see his name, you'd see his dates, relevant scripture references. But we added these descriptions in the expanded timeline. Um, well, before we did that, I was trying to um, fulfill that that function using the, the photo museum. So if you look, um, when I hover over David, you'll see down in the instant details, because I've set up the photo museum to be my default tool from the timeline, um, you see the photo museum article uh, for David. So if I double click, now I get um, an extensive description of David, um, a long article about uh, his entire life. I get images that uh, I can look at. So here's a mosaic um, that shows David playing his harp. Um, this sort of uh, was a Hellenistic period mosaic. So it it uh, mixed David with um, the uh, the Greek mythological figure Orpheus. And so this shows all the animals kind of bowing down and getting um, getting charmed by David's music, and um, and David slays Goliath. There, here's a mosaic of a giant fighting um, guys. It's not clear if if that's really Goliath or not, but uh, but anyway. So you've got all of these um, images now that you can access from uh, the timeline, and um, so the photo museum doesn't cover everything that's on the timeline. Um, but it, uh, I do cover all of the uh, Hebrew kings. So here's an article on Saul, Ishbosheth, and you can see if there's a photo museum article on something. 
by just hovering over um, that item on the timeline on the timeline and looking down in the instant details. So there's an article on Ishbosheth. This is actually kind of interesting um, because there's a jug um, that has been inscribed in, in Paleo-Hebrew script uh, with the name Eshbaal. Well, Ishbosheth was probably not Saul's son's real name. It was probably Eshbaal, which is actually the name that's given in First Chronicles. But because um, Baal, um, Baal simply means Lord, and uh, so. Uh, Early on, it was um, it was just used um, as a uh, maybe in reference to Yahweh, um, but as the Canaanite storm god Baal became more prominent in Israel, um, the biblical writers were loath to use the name Baal, so they substituted uh, the word Boshet, which means shame, for Baal, and so Esh Baal becomes Ish Boshet. Um, and uh, so uh, you also have this kind of play on, you know, instead of um, a name that means man of um, of the Lord, uh, it now means man of shame. And uh, so uh, there's there's all kinds of wordplay going on and everything with Ishbosheth. But you can see we've got um, Solomon. If we go to um, Rehoboam, uh, there's an article on Rehoboam, or Athaliah, and so on. So you can always see, is there an article on something in the timeline by hovering over it? Uh, and we cover other things, like writings. Here's the Gezer calendar. Um, and so, uh, or we can uh, do Joel, and there's, um, there's an article on the book of Joel, or on the prophet Joel. And uh, then we have um, events like Shishak invades Judah, and so I'll double click that, and here's an article on the the invasion by the uh, the Egyptian pharaoh Shishak, and uh, here are some models of um, Egyptian warriors. Uh, so here you've got Egyptian forces uh, marching in ranks uh, to invade Judah, and uh, Shishak is interesting because uh, he actually has a relief at the Temple of Karnak that shows him defeating his enemies, and these are Canaanite enemies. And uh, if we go to the next picture here, well, here he is. Here are Canaanites on the ground um, begging for mercy. And then the next um, image shows uh, all of these bound prisoners with um, these name rings that name where these people are from. And so you have the place names uh, that Shishak conquered. So um, he names Gibeon. Um, he may, uh, there's, I think there's a lacuna right here, which um, some have speculated may be Jerusalem and, uh, and so on. So um, this article will talk all about uh, Shishak's invasion and, and so on. Um, the other thing that I want you to see in accordance, now that we're talking about um, an event that has led us to a relief that has a hieroglyphic inscription, is where there are inscriptions, I have included links to um, all of the available uh, resources in accordance that will give you those um, those inscriptions. So um, just last week re we released um, an upgrade to the context of scripture that add, added the fourth volume. And um, that fourth volume includes a translation of the Levant campaign of Shoshank the first. So um, that's the biblical um, pharaoh named in the Bible is Shishak. And if we click on that, now we get um, an article by Kenneth Kitchen um, that talks about this particular inscription, and then um, we'll give you a translation of the um, inscription. So let's see, here it is. Um, so here's now 
uh, a translation of this particular inscription. And we should see um, eventually the topographical list. So this is the list of all of those bound prisoners that were um, had those name rings. And uh, it starts talking about, here's a fragmentary one that may be Gaza and Makeda and uh, Rebute and Tanakh and Shunem and Bethshan and Rehob. So uh, these are all sites in, um, in Israel. And the interesting thing about this is uh, Shishak, uh, the Bible talks about Shishak invading Judah. And Shishak had previously sheltered um, Rehoboam, or Jeroboam I, who broke away from Solomon's son Rehoboam and, uh, and inaugurated the period of the divided kingdom. So um, Shishak had, had sheltered Jeroboam, but when he invades, once the kingdom becomes divided, this Egyptian pharaoh decides, you know, well, now there's a weakness that I can exploit, and he invades um, uh, Judah. And so there are sites in Judah, like um, Gibeon, for example, and Beth Horon, but there are also sites further north in Israel. Um, and so it appears that Shishak was not above uh, invading and attacking the territories of, of this um, political exile, Jeroboam, that he had sheltered um, previously. So, um, so that's the context of scripture. So we do this for um, any, any relief that, um, that I could find in other resources that we have in accordance, I um, included the links so that you can actually read those reliefs. Uh, so in this way, the um, the photo museum becomes a springboard to, to further study, a, a way to get into other resources. In fact, if, if you look at context of scripture, context of scripture is a wonderful resource. Um, it's got four volumes, as I've said. Um, if you it, um, up until now, it's had three. We just released the, the fourth volume. But um, it can be a little overwhelming if you're just browsing context of scripture because volume one is com canonical uh, compositions from the um, biblical period, I think. And so you have Egyptian canonical compositions, Hittite, West Semitic, Akkadian, and there's a lot of material here. So these are, you know, Egyptian canonical compositions with a divine focus, with a royal focus, etc. cetera. And, um, you know, I don't often have the time to curl up with context of scripture and just sort of browse and, and read um, all of these ancient, um, ancient texts. But from the photo museum, I'll quite often see something as I'm, as I'm mining the photo museum for photographs or, or looking something up that, well, hey, here's a real, um, here's a link to Koss. Um, let's go to that and, and read that, and I'll often find uh, interesting things that way. So um, here in this article, too, there's another link to the Sacred Bridge. And the Sacred Bridge is um, a, a biblical atlas, um, historical atlas, by the Israeli um, publisher Carta. And um, in the Sacred Bridge, uh, he includes um, excursuses of, um, of different important inscriptions. And so as he's reconstructing the, um, the places, um, the biblical geography in different periods, he will sometimes give extended, um, he being Anson Rainey, the author of the Sacred Bridge, um, uh, the one of the authors of the Sacred Bridge, Stephen Notley, um, is the author that did the New Testament portions. But um, both of whom were accordance users, by the way. Um, but uh, this, he includes a um, an extended discussion of uh, this particular relief and uh, has reconstructions with the hieroglyphic symbols and and uh, and so on. Of, uh, of that particular topic, um, topographical list. So there's all kinds of material that's available in accordance. And I wanted the photo museum to become 
sort of a clearinghouse that would connect you to some of these other resources. So, um, so hopefully you'll you'll find uh, that pretty helpful. All right, so um, let me find some other examples of inscriptions. Um, let me do. I'm just going to do a search for um, for EP. And uh, EP is the abbreviation for Echoes from the Past, which is a um, a book by Carta, the Israeli publisher, that does a lot of the same things that Context of Scripture does. It's narrower in scope. It's not as um, extensive. Um, but uh, Echoes from the Past is a really nice resource too. Let's um, so when I did that search, the first thing that came up was the Tel Dan inscription. And this is an Aramaic inscription um, that uh, dates to the time of the divided kingdom. And it was found in the um, Israelite uh, center of Dan. And um, in this inscription, it mentions Beit David. Um, and we can see a closer uh, look at, so these three letters here, this is the Bet, the Yod, and the Taf of Beit, and then this is David, um, and this is the earliest um, inscriptional mention of uh, the House of David. Uh, I think that's still correct. I, um, maybe they found an earlier one since then, but I believe it's still the earliest uh, reference, extra-biblical reference to the House of David uh, that's been found. And so, you can see um, that uh, we can click on uh, Echoes from the Past, and there's an entire appendix devoted to this. And you have, uh, the nice thing about Echoes from the Past is it's not just translation, it's also um, transcription of these inscriptions into the original. So uh, if you read Hebrew, uh, you can read these in the original. You can then read them in translation and um, they'll sometimes include illustrations as well. And then they'll have commentary. So this is a commentary on the translation, and they'll talk about why they they uh, reconstructed this fragmentary word this way or, or whatever. Um, so it's fascinating stuff. So that's echoes from the past. And um, we also have our inscriptions and uh, Hebrew inscriptions and Northwest inscriptions uh, modules. And so um, this is, uh, so these are modules that are grammatically tagged. Um, let's see, are the inscriptions tagged? Uh, yeah. So, you know, this is telling me this is a preposition. Um, this is a third masculine singular. And uh, I can add um, the, uh, Northwest Inscriptions English in translation. And uh, so I can work my way through the Tel Dan inscription with the English in parallel. So you've got lots of different ways to access this material. Um, and I figured, you know, well, maybe, maybe you've got the Aramaic um, Northwest Inscriptions modules, but you don't have context of scripture and uh, context of scripture is kind of pricey. You don't want to buy context of scripture. So I linked to all of them, um, and uh, you can still access those if you don't have, if you have some but not the others. Um, this leads me to another example of the strength of the photo museum, and that's just how much it's internally linked. So you've got these external links to um, the inscriptions, context of scripture, echoes from the past, but you also have all of these internal links. So mentions the house of David, I can go to David and read about David. Or um, these are the, the back and forward buttons when you hyperlink um, down here. They're kind of hidden down here, but down here by the, uh, um, by the go-to box, I can click to go back and say, okay, well, I've read about David. Now let's read about Hazael, um, who is the Aramaic, um, Aramaic ruler who is being hailed in this Arama Aramaic um, inscription that's talking about the, the defeat of the house of David by Ben-Hadad um, or by Hazael, the, uh, the Aramean king. So um, here's a, an ivory relief that it's speculated this might be Hazael because it was found in his palace 
Um, it's not altogether certain that it is, um, but you can read all about Hazael. Here is a um, stela of Shalmaneser the third that mentions um, Hazael and uh, and so on. And again, we've got links in context of scripture and Raging Torrent, which is um, Raging Torrent is another resource by Carta that is like Echoes from the Past. Echoes from the Past covers biblical inscriptions. Uh, or inscriptions inside Israel, uh, Hebrew inscriptions, basically. And the Raging Torrent covers um, Assyrian and Babylonian inscriptions. So here you've got inscriptions of Shalmaneser III, and Adad Narari III, and, and so on. So um, it's another resource that's linked to uh, from the photo museum. But uh, here you've got... Um, you know, I can link to Shalmaneser the third and now read about Shalmaneser the third. And uh, notice also that place names like Kala are linked to the photo guide. So I can go to the photo guide and read about Kala where this particular uh, inscription was found and so on. So um, I really tried to make the photo museum a resource. I, I tried to make the photo museum the kind of resource that I want to use. Um, and so all of these features that that we've added, um, I've, I've really kind of added for my own convenience, and uh, and hopefully you all will will benefit um, from that as well. Um, but uh, um, so those are some of the ways that that I would recommend um, using the photo museum. Let's talk a little bit about um, new material, and in the the handout that. Uh, um, that was attached. I've got a complete list of um, of some of the new articles. So uh, I've tried to cover every major um, major people group um, in the ancient Near East. Uh, so you'll find articles on the Ammonites, the Arameans, um, the Assyrians. And you know these articles will give a basic um, basic history with some images. Um, so you know here's the cylinder of Tiglath Pileser from this particular Middle Assyrian Empire. Um, but if you want more pictures, you can click and go to Tiglath Pileser, and and there may be more. Um, in this case, there's only that one for that particular uh, ruler. But uh, you can go through, and um, there are articles under rulers that uh, will cover every, um, well, not every Assyrian ruler, but just about every um, biblically relevant Assyrian ruler and, uh, and Aramean rulers and so on. So you've got the main article on a people group and then you sometimes have under rulers, uh, the rulers of that particular um, people group. All right, so you'll want to look in, in both of those places. And again, there are links back and forth between these articles. Um, the, uh, so we've got, um, got all of those. Babylonians we've covered. Um, and then uh, the Canaanites. And underneath uh, each of these uh, people groups, I've, uh, for most of them, I haven't done it for the, the Greeks and the Romans yet. Sorry, um, that was a... Uh, another can of worms I didn't get to, but uh, but for every other people group, uh, there should be a article on um, the religion of that particular people group. So for the Canaanites, especially uh, especially biblically relevant, um, we've got Canaanite religion. It talks about uh, religion um, in general, and then it will go through each of the Canaanite deities and show you, um, here's an early inscription with the name L uh, on it. And uh, then this is the, um, uh, the creation of the, the dawn and the dusk. This is from the Ugaritic uh, library. And so these are Ugaritic legends of the god L and uh, then figurines of L and, and so on. So, um, and then if we go to Baal, you'll find uh, all kinds of images of um, Baal. Uh, Baal was probably a title um, rather than a proper name. And so 
you'll sometimes see Baal Hadad. Um, Hadad was probably the god's uh, actual name, and uh, but he becomes referred to as as Baal in uh, the biblical text. So, um, so you've got all kinds of information about each of these gods and and so on. So be sure when you're looking at the articles on peoples. Uh, be sure to check out the religion article. And uh, if we go to Egyptians, um, we had Egyptians covered through, I think, about the New Kingdom period before. Uh, I've now basically gone through um, Egyptian history um, through the Roman Empire. So that's some 3,000 years of, of history that's being covered there. Um, I, later this week, there's going to be a blog post about how I, I procrastinated working on the Egyptians article uh, for the photo museum because it's just so much um, to learn and so much to decipher and uh, so much to cover. But uh, we've now covered all of Egyptian history and there's an article on Egyptian religion. And if you want to talk about cans of worms, um, Egyptian religion is a enormous can of worms. So um, you'll see under Egyptian religion, um, I've got a, an article on creation myths. There are several of them. Um, and I talk about how these various myths relate to um, the Genesis creation narratives. Uh, so there's a myth about Ptah speaking um, the creation into being. And then um, there's uh, another myth that starts out with the pre, uh, with the primordial state um, being one of swirling waters with these gods that represented um, water and formlessness and hiddenness and darkness. Well, that uh, sounds very much like uh, darkness covered the surface of the watery depths and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So um, in the blog post that will be posted in a, a day or two, um, I talk about how I really wasn't that interested in Egypt uh, until I started to see all of these connections between Egypt and, um, and the biblical um, text. And then all of a sudden, Egypt became interesting to me. And now I've, I've become something of an a Egyptophile and even, uh, even learned how to read hieroglyphics partly to help me write the photo museum so that I can uh, identify, you know, is this picture, which pharaoh is this, or which god is is this, or so on. Um, well, in fact, I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, we have creation myths, and uh, then solar deities. There are, there's not just the sun god Ray. There are um, a number of different solar deities. Um, and uh, you'll see uh, how those are um, depicted. And um, let's see, I'm trying to get to, uh, not that one, this one. Um, this relief shows several um, solar deities. Um, you have the god Ray in his falcon form. That's not Horus, that's Ray. Um, you can tell the difference generally by the, the hat that they're wearing. If it's a sun disk, um, it's Ray. If it's a, um, a double crown of Egypt, then it's usually Horus. Although the two gods kind of get merged sometimes, so sometimes it may be Ray Harakti, which is uh, Ray and Horus merged together. And then you've got, um, uh, let me zoom in here. This is a god with a sun disk and a scarab beetle in the sun disk. Well, that is the god Kepri. And then here's a ram-headed god. Um, that is the nightly manifestation of Ray. So when he's in the underworld um, traveling at night, he assumes this form. And so you see, um, I believe this is Seti the first bowing down before each of these manifestations of the sun god. So it's it's an absolutely bewildering um, world, and I've tried to to sort it out as best I can um, uh, so that it makes sense uh, to you. Um, I was going to talk about, let's see, um, so we also cover the mythology of Osiris and uh, Horus and, and all of that. 
And uh, then I go into other Egyptian deities. So I talk about Amun, who became uh, the supreme god and kind of merged with Ra to become Amon-Ra and, and so on. And uh, then, so I cover a few. Uh, there are, I could have covered a lot more Egyptian deities, but I tried to cover the most important. So I've got Ptah, Toth, um, Anubis, and Hathor. And uh, here's, Here's what drove me to um, to take a course in hieroglyphics so that I could um, so that I could actually read some of these inscriptions and figure out what exactly was going on, because um, if you look at this particular image, um, it's the goddess Hathor, but it looks exactly like how the goddess Isis is betrayed is is betrayed is portrayed. Um, and the only way really to tell the difference um, is by looking at the hieroglyphs. And so if this were Isis, you would see a little throne up here, um, which is the hieroglyph for um, for Isis. But Hathor is, um, her hieroglyph is a, a square house with a falcon inside. Um, and the name Hathor actually means the house of Horus. And uh, you can read about um, her connection to Horus. But um, if, uh, if I hadn't learned hieroglyphs, I would have looked at this and thought immediately that it was ISIS. So anyway, I've, I've, um, I've done my research to try and, um, try and decipher this stuff for you as, as much as I can. Um, I'm strictly a rank amateur and, and, uh, and, um, trained Egyptologists might cringe at, at some of my descriptions, but I've tried to be as accurate as, as I, I can. All right, so um, so that's that's the religion article. Um, let me show you two other sub articles under Egyptian religion. Um, I think these are are really cool. Um, the Egyptian concept of the afterlife is again bewildering. Um, there are several different forms of the Egyptian soul. Um, there's the the body. Uh, well, uh, there's several different aspects to a person. Um, one is the body, the physical body, the, the pet, and then um, and the reason that the body had to be preserved through mummification was because um, the the soul eventually had to be reunited with the body. And uh, then you have the um, the soul itself, which takes various forms. There's uh, Ah, and these are all different. Sort of. Ah, the manifestations of the soul after death, and uh, and so I I talk about. Um, Information there. I have a um, was telling me that my internet connection is slow, so I, I'll turn off my uh, my webcam, and hopefully you all are still hearing me okay. But um, this covers the Exodus plagues as divine warfare, and I talk about the importance of um, of Maat, which is the sort of principle of cosmic order, and how the Pharaoh was supposed to maintain Maat, and so. Um, so the Egyptian plagues actually are an assault on the Pharaoh's ability to maintain Ma'at and, uh, and are an, a direct attack on Pharaoh. And then I talk about attempts that have been made to identify each plague with particular Egyptian deities. And um, I don't think that's the most helpful approach. And I, I talk about that. So. Um, let me just ask Rick or am I coming through okay because I'm a little worried that uh, that I may be breaking yeah up. We, we had it we had about I don't know 20 seconds or so where you were garbled or gone but uh, we hear you better now especially with the video turned off I think okay good all right so um, so that's um, the various peoples and uh, and religion um, there are um, other new articles that are more aimed at explaining um, cultural aspects. Uh, so there's a new article on um, circumcision. 
Um, it's it's a little graphic. Um, there are actually Egyptian reliefs that show uh, Egyptian men being um, circumcised. Uh, this poor guy is um, is about to faint. This guy's tougher and um, is taking it like a man. But um, but it talks about the difference between Egyptian circumcision and and uh, Hebrew circumcision and and um, and how that explains certain biblical passages. And then it'll talk about um, about uh, in the New Testament where uh, it speaks of um, where Paul says, you know, anyone who's been circumcised should not try to be uncircumcised. Well, I always thought that was figurative language, but uh, there were ways that um, that uh, Jewish men in the Hellenistic period would try to mask their circumcision. I mean, think about the the challenges of um, trying to fit in in a culture that practices public nudity in athletic events and in in the public baths and so on. Um, they resorted to methods to, to try to uh, to hide the fact of their circumcision. So uh, it's an an interesting article that covers a lot of uh, a lot of texts that we read and and we sort of read as well. That's got to be metaphorical, and we don't realize you know, there's actually um, some historical realities behind this. Um, if you go to burial, we've ex we had an article on Egyptian burial practices, but it's greatly expanded um, with lots of additional photos and, and more information. Um, we've also added Roman burial practices and uh, Christian burial practices. Uh, so this will talk about um, Roman, uh, um, um, what's the word? Um, when you, uh, when you burn a body, I can't, I'm getting brain dead. Um, cremation, that's it. Um, so it'll talk about cremation, and um, and uh, so you've got cinerary urns uh, where cremated remains were stored. And in the Roman, the Hellenistic and, and Roman periods, it's absolutely fascinating um, how many um, epitaphs, burial epitaphs that we have. And uh, so I've got a number of those epitaphs that um, that talk about various aspects of um, of burial and uh, views of the afterlife. So um, this epitaph for a poet, um, this poet apparently had a pretty good life, um, and now he's uh, contrasting his fame as a poet and his cheerfulness as a dinner party host, host with his current lamentable state. Now I am only a handful of ashes from a pyre of mourning. And there's not a lot of uh, hope for the afterlife in um, in these Roman epitaphs. Um, and there's one um, there's one for a uh, a, a female lover um, uh, that uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, I could search for it, but uh, um, yeah, here we go. Epitaph for a lover. Um, this, um, the person who wrote this epitaph, it's a long inscription, and I mean, it gives lurid details about, um, about the beauty of his lover's, um, legs and, and, uh, body and, and so on. Um, but then he laments that all that remains of her active body is confined in a little urn. Um, and so, uh, really poignant, um, poignant stuff that gives you a feel for, for what these people, um, uh, how they lived and and how they uh, related to one another and so on. And then there are um, Christian burial practices, and I'll talk about the shift from cremation to to burial. It'll talk about the catacombs, and uh, there are also some interesting epitaphs um, here. That uh, here's one that mentions the Holy Spirit, and um, uh, this one's interesting because. Um, it mentions a, a woman who departed in faith and her brother who um, departed in peace. And so the question is, are these two Christians and they're just using various ways of, of talking about departing? Or was um, the brother who departed in peace not a Christian 
And so um, that's an attempt to indicate that, well, he departed in peace, but but not in faith like um, like his sister um, and so on. There's, there's also an epitaph that has um, Jewish and, and pagan symbols that maybe up here, yeah, here. This is interesting because um, this epitaph has the DM, which um, stands for uh, Dies Manes or something like that. Um, it's uh, to the gods of the underworld. And, um, and then it says um, Ichthus Zonton, which means living fish, but you have the Ichthus of um, the, the Christian fish symbol and the anchor, which was also a, a, a symbol for, for Christians. So um, this is interesting because you have pagan, you know, the pagan burial formula combined with Christian symbols. And the question is, well, were the, these Christians that were trying to, you know, not to flout burial convention by including the, uh, the mention of the gods of the underworld, um, were these, was this a pagan family that had a, um, uh, you know, or was this a, um, yeah, let's see, um, the other alternative I think was a pagan family sort of trying to honor the person's Christian faith, but also their own uh, traditional Roman sensibilities and, and so on. So there's, there's all kinds of really interesting um, stuff in here, and, and I'd encourage you just to to take time and browse and, and explore and, and search and, and see what you find. Um, and like I said, you've got the handout that has uh, all of the um, all of the new articles, uh, and um, so uh, uh, so be sure to to check those out. All right, I want to leave a, a little bit of time for for questions. Just, um, Anybody have any questions about the new photo museum or? We, we've got a number of questions, David. And okay. uh, l let me say before we go with the questions that, you know, on one hand, I'm disappointed that you don't want to often curl up with context of scripture. I know. Um, and, and, but on the other hand, I'm very impressed that you took a class in hieroglyphics just so that you could understand a lot of these uh, Egyptian symbols. That, that's, that's above and beyond. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, yeah, oh. a little on the crazy side too, but um, but yeah, it's actually it's actually quite um, quite fun and uh, I bet. and drawing um, drawing hieroglyphs is is kind of therapeutic. So you know you've got all these all these uh, coloring Bibles and and Bible study yeah. things we'll do now and uh, just take hieroglyphics. It's it's pretty uh, relaxing to. Because it takes a while to write, takes a while to write hieroglyphics. I'm sure. I'm sure. All right. Uh, well, we'll go back to the earliest questions and work our way down. Down. Uh, one question was, how many new pictures? Um, so there are 350. Um, it, I think it's technically like 347 or something like that. Um, new pictures. Okay. What rights do we have for sharing images or using in personal works? What sort of attributions are needed? Um, so we talk about that at the beginning of the photo museum. And uh, basically, um, if, if it doesn't have a copyright notice um, on, the, on the image, um, you'll find some um, some photos copyright uh, Israel Antiquities Authority or uh, Rick Mansfield um, has contributed some photos. And uh, so if you find um, uh, find those kinds of notifications, um, you'd need to contact that person if you're wanting to reproduce or republish uh, their material. But um, all of the photographs that belong to Oak Tree Software um, you are welcome to use as long as you know if you're if you're going to publish them in a book, um, then you know we'd ask that you contact us and and get permission to republish the photos. Or if you're publishing them online in a in a way that you know you're going to you want to include the, a high resolution copy of the image and it's going to be accessible to you know anybody in the world. Um, then you know we'd ask that you uh, that you contact us for permission. But for most uses, uh, web pages, um, 
uh, you know, I've used images from the photo museum and the photo guide and, and other accordance images in uh, my YouTube videos, um, on um, blogs, and uh, and in class. You're free to use any of these images um, in class and, and so on, um, projecting for an audience and, and and so on. Again, the the real question is, you know, how much are you republishing the image, and um, and how how accessible is that republished image going to be? So if if you you know if you use an image in a in a keynote presentation and that's part of some um, online class that's um, you know that's available to the world, um, then you might want to just contact us and make sure uh, you have permission. But for the most part, you're free to use uh, the images pretty broadly. All right. Um... This was when you were showing the portraits, and the last part of this question I think we answered because it asked were there any portraits of women or only men. So we saw some women, but it, uh, the question here was: Are all the portraits we just saw of individuals who died, or some of people while they were still alive? Well, I imagine that they were probably painted while the individual was still alive, um, but but they were um, they were found as um, as part of the burial accoutrement um, of of these individuals, so um, some of the, as I understand it, some of the the panels have been found um, separated from the mummies. Um, but uh, and and so that's why you know I include some photographs where they're actually attached um, to the mummies. But um, there are there's variation in um, in artistic quality. Um, for example, uh, the the paintings. I don't really go into this in the in the article, but um, the paintings from a certain area um, tend to be better than the the paintings that were found in another area. So this this is done with acrylic um, and it's a little rougher. Um, and then you know this was done in in caustic. Um, and it's uh, you can tell it's um, finer um, artistry. So, uh, but but yeah, there's you know some of these don't look particularly realistic at all, and uh, and then others um, look uh, look more realistic. And uh, and they've they've analyzed their, you know scholars have analyzed the hairstyles, and so some of these will tell you well this dates to the Trajanic. Um, period because uh, the hairstyle fits that particular period and and uh, and so on. But these tended to be high class Romans. Um, uh, another thing that you'll notice as you scroll through, um, the there's there's a lot of variation in skin tone. Um, and the biggest difference that I see is between men and women. Um, so men tend to be, um, have darker complexions than the women that are uh, portrayed. Um, and so that may be a function of the women have more aristocratic lifestyles and they're indoors more, or it may reflect ethnic differences. Uh, that's, that's sort of the Gordian knot that, you know, that people have to unravel from this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, here you have a, a relatively pale um, woman um, and then uh, here's a, a darker um, uh, skinned man, but I mean they're they're just really striking. You know, look at look at the eyes and how uh, how alive they seem. It's really uh, really cool works. And uh, there are some poignant um, uh, poignant portraits. This is a, a wealthy woman named Aline. We know her name because it was inscribed on the on the mummy and uh, she was buried with two of her children that apparently died in mm. around uh, one I think around three to four and then one as an infant um, and uh, so you see uh, see the humanity there here's another child um, mummy it's very interesting uh, all right. Uh, searching for images. What do you recommend searching by caption 
or by content or by entry? What's the best way? Um, I'd, I'd start with captions if you're searching for images. So, you know, for um, like earlier, you know, I said Peter. Um, well, let's let's see what we find um, for Peter. Um, and uh, this is sort of not really that illustrative. It just mentions Peter. Um, but we should see uh, this is the Tyrian shekel that was probably the coin Peter found in the fish's mouth. Um, that's kind of interesting. Here are images of the crucifixion of Peter upside down. And uh, so, you know, I could have used this image instead of one of the, the mummy portraits for my, uh, for my slideshow. Uh, so it, um, I would start with the, um, with the images. Now here, you know, you'll get some false hits, like this is uh, crucifixion of Jesus by Peter Paul Rubens. So the Peter there is not the Peter um, that you're probably searching for. And then you can expand outward and go, okay, well, let's search the, the articles and see what we, find, um, what we find in relation to this. So this ends up finding um, Peter warning Christians to be alert because their enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. And uh, this is talking about biblical mentions of lions. And there's an image of Daniel in the lion's den and so on. Uh, so you'll find all kinds of interesting um, connections. Uh, by, but I'd, I'd start with captions first and then go to the articles. Or, I don't you know, obviously, obviously searching the entry. You know, if I want Jonah, um, I'll get a whole article about Jonah. So. I don't uh, remember the content. Oh, I'm sorry. Great. Um, here's a rather graphic uh, fish swallowing Jonah image. So. Hmm. I don't remember the context for this particular question, but the uh, person asked, it would seem dates would be important. So is there a way to sort by dates? I don't think there is, but I'll let you answer that. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's not really a way to sort by date. Um, but in general, um, where I'm going through, um, <clears throat> through uh, various kinds of, of um, entries, uh, you'll find them in chronological order. So, uh, for example, one of the things, this was one of the questions that we had in organizing the, the photo museum, you know, do I have Jonah under J, um, just sort of as a, a separate full-blown article, or do I have a, a main article on profits and then have Jonah as a sub-article underneath? And so we decided to go with the, the latter approach. And, um, and sometimes I'll link from, uh, from the, you know, the point in the, um, in the alphabet. So uh, we don't even have a J um, alphabetic entry. And I toyed with, you know, do I put Jonah here and then say C under profits? Sometimes I do that. But I kind of figured, you know what, if you search for Jonah, you're not going to want the first entry to be Jonah C under profits. You want to just go right there. So um, so I did that some, but not, um, not extensively. So anyway, um, all that to say that each of these profits is ordered chronologically. Um, so you've got, um, you know, it starts with, with Gad and Nathan. Um, the prophets of, of David, and then um, and then you have Elijah and Elisha. Uh, so here's some Byzantine art of Elijah, and uh, um, and uh, you know if I were doing a oh this is interesting here's a a jug that's uh, inscribed to Elijah. Um, now you know did this belong to Elijah? Uh, probably not, but who knows and um, and if you're illustrating the fact that when um, at the showdown with the, the prophets of Baal, um, the name Elijah means um, uh, my God is Yahweh. And so at the end of that episode where the, the lightning strikes the sacrifice and, and the flame goes up, 
the people start calling out um, uh, um, Adonai Hu Ha Elohim, um, the Lord, He is God, which is sort of echoes Elijah's name. So if I wanted to illustrate that, I might use this jug image and, and put that on a slide in, in talking about that and so on. So, um, so prophets are organized chronologically, rulers underneath each, um, each ethnicity are organized chronologically um, and so on. So starting with the Syrian rulers, you've got Shamshi Adad in 1800 BC, um, and here's a, a big gap. Um, so uh, uh, jumping to Shalmanes of the first, and then when you get into the more biblically relevant um, um, rulers, you'll find uh, those those all are covered um, sequentially. So Asher Dan the third, I believe, um, this was the um, uh, likely the king that. Uh, ruled at the time of um, of Jonah, and uh, the Assyrian eponym list, which is basically a chronicle of all these different years and what happened in that year. The eponym list for this period mention um, a a solar eclipse, a um, a revolt, a couple of plagues. So there's all this instability in the Assyrian Empire. At the time that Jonah shows up and says, "Hey, my God's going to strike you down," and it's always struck me as, you know, why would these Assyrians pay attention to this, to this prophet from the, um, from the sticks, as they, as far as they were concerned, of a God that they've probably never heard of? Well, given what they were going through and the fear and uncertainty of of that time, uh, it it actually makes more sense that they would be receptive to, uh, we better repent in sackcloth and ashes. So uh, there's all kinds of interesting, um, interesting stuff like that. But, but all of that kind of stuff is, is chronological. And of course the articles on Egyptians and, and so on, those go chronologically as well. Any other questions? Sorry, I, mean, I was muted. Um, very specific question. Are there any images to illustrate prisons for teaching the prison letters of Paul? Um, there, there are a couple of, well, let's see. Um, Let's see what we find. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, this is under captions. I don't believe so. I think your better bet would be to um, to search the photo guide because you will find, um, if we go to the photo guide and go to captions, um, you'll... Uh, uh, you'll find different prisons, photographs of prisons, um, including in um, the traditional prison of Paul and Philippi. And uh, you'll find under, um, let's see, um, under... St. Peter's um, Galakantu in, uh, um, is a, a church in Israel. And uh, notice that, so the overview will give a couple of representative photographs. And then um, you'll have links to the photo guide Israel and, and so on. Um, and uh, um, I believe the photo guides are on sale right now. So if you don't have some of these more specific photo guides, um, now is a good time to upgrade. But um, if we go to St. Peter Galakantu in the photo guide Israel, there is um, underneath the church, there are um, dungeons in um, at that particular church. And um, 
And so this is probably where, um, where Jesus was interrogated and imprisoned um, on the night um, that uh, uh, he was um, brought before the Sanhedrin and, and so on. Because I believe this is, St. Peter Galicantu is, um, is where Caiaphas' house uh, would have been. Um, so those are uh, your best bets to search the photo guy for um, for prisons. All right. Is there a way to connect text to maps? Um, or bi connect Bible text to maps to the photo museum to find locations quickly? Are location images updated to current research as current as possible? For example, the different locations for AI. Um, There's a number okay. of questions together. Yeah, yeah, read that one to me again. Is there a way to connect? Uh, the first, connect the first part I did not. Yeah, is there Go a ahead. way to connect? Can Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Is there a way to connect Bible text to maps to photo museum to find locations quickly? Are location images updated to current research as current as possible? For example, the different locations for AI. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of more of an Atlas question. Um, if, uh, if you search for I in, um, in the Atlas, I believe there may be a couple of different locations. Uh, now I'm thinking of Jericho, but, um, um, but yeah, this is our, our data. You may find that, you know, um, if uh, if they've discovered a new site uh, and they say, well, you know, now we think this is the site, um, our data may be out of date, um, but we've uh, based it on archaeological data um, at the time of each upgrade and tried to to keep things current. But I can't Your guarantee that. In the instant details, there mentions two separate cities. Yeah, let's see. Um, uh, the name I means the ruin um, is apparently a reference. So there's an eye of Canaan. Um, that's the biblical eye. And there's an eye of the Ammonites that, that they haven't even discovered. Um, so, uh, but yeah, you know, your photo guide is going to um, give you more photos of that. And uh, so it's talking about Kerbet el Makatir is the, the tell that is currently believed to represent I. Um, so, you know, if that's out of date, um, let us know um, because it's impossible to, to keep up with everything. Um, but we do occasionally have um, have scholars go, hey, you know, this is um, this is old information. You need to update this. And and as we as we get that, we do our best to correct it. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of, you know, you just saw me go from the atlas to the, the photo guide and you can go from the biblical text directly to the, um, to the atlas or photo museum. So um, if I'm, um, you know, if I'm here, I may, um, I may select I and go to the atlas. I can go directly to the photo guide. I can go. Uh, to the photo museum if I want to. Um, if uh, let's do, I don't know that I will be in the photo museum, but Bethel surely will. Um, so let's see, visual photo museum. And uh, so this takes me to an article on um, the horns of the altar and uh, that Bethel will be cut off and fall to the ground. The horns at the altar of Bethel will be cut off. And then we should uh, probably find references to the, uh, the temple in Dan, sanctuary in Dan, and so on. All right, I think you've just shown us part of the answer to this next question, but what do you suggest as the default resource for the atlas and the timeline? Um, so let's, that's a good question. Let's um, talk about where you set that up. So if you go to preferences and you go to um, Atlas tab display, that's where you set your default tool for the Atlas. I have mine set to the photo guide overview. 
Now, the photo guide overview will link to the um, photo guide Israel, Egypt, Near East, etc. So if you have all those others, um, those cover those particular geographical areas. But it's the photo guide overview that has all of the sites. Um, and the reason that we did this is because we we've, we've added so many photographs to the to the photo guide over the years that the modules actually became um, too big and we had to split them up. So um, what we did was we split them up by region and we have the photo guide overview, which just has one or two pictures of most sites and then links to the more extensive articles in, in the other photo guides. So that's what I would use for, um, for the Atlas. Although you can use anything. If you want to use Anchor Bible Dictionary, you can use um, a Bible Dictionary or whatever else you want. Um, but the photo guide is really custom designed to work with the Atlas. And the same with the timeline. Um, so for the timeline, you can set your default tool. And so this is under timeline display. You can set your default tool and default text. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, so I have mine set to the Photo Museum 3. Now, I still have the Photo Museum 1 and 2 that I basically keep for for comparison purposes, um, but uh, these are basically superseded by the Photo Museum 3. So once you've installed the Photo Museum 3, you might want to deinstall those from your library and then make sure that you set the Photo Museum 3 as your default tool. But if you don't deinstall them, you know, um, and you don't set this to the Photo Museum 3, you may find that it still opens up the Photo Museum 2 if you still have that. Um, so uh, anyway, be sure to, to set that to Photo Museum 3 if you upgrade. Was, was anything removed from Photo Museum 2 or is it a proper subset of Photo Museum 3? Um, nothing was removed. There are occasional photos, I mean, probably fewer than, than half a dozen, um, but there were some photos that I replaced because we now had higher higher quality photos or photos that that illustrated um, those better. Um, there was one mistake. Um, if, uh, if we go to the Photo Museum 2, and uh, I think it's it's right here with with Shishak. Um, so if I do Shishak, and we look at the reliefs of um, Shishak's military exploits, um, these are actually um, this is a relief of. Shishak's um, battles. It is Shishak, but it's not the relief that um, that has the uh, account of the campaign. And uh, again, learning hieroglyphics, I realized this, and you know, I started looking at these pictures, and I started going, "Wait, where are the? There should be prisoners in this relief, and this particular relief didn't have the bound prisoners." Um, and uh, so anyway, I realized that I had uh, gotten it wrong in the photo museum too. So now um, here are the reliefs of Shishak's um, military exploits. Basically, the pictures that we had before are off to the um, to the right, and uh, um, so it's the same wall, but but the pictures were focused on the wrong part. Uh, so anyway, I've replaced those pictures and, and zeroed in on the the uh, prisoner rings and so on. So we've added some um, some stuff uh, that's higher quality photographs. But I can't really think of a photograph that you know if if I felt like well you might still want that photograph I wouldn't take it out. I'd just add new photographs. So I only replaced photographs that I thought oh this picture is clearly better. So I don't think there's really a need to keep the photo museum I think it's too. pretty amazing that you figured out there was a mistake because you took that class on hieroglyphics. Um, <laughs> the, so here's a question. Um, hey, um, can I interrupt just for a second, sure. um, Rick? Um, uh, just had a, a, something I wanted to add related to the, um, the, the last question where you were setting the photo museum as um, the default tool for your timeline. Um, if if you do that, 
and you hover over an item in the timeline and it's not in the photo museum, it goes to the next resource in your library and tries to look for it there. Um, right. Now, if you've, if, you've just, if you've just purchased the photo museum, um, it probably will end up at the bottom of your vi the visual category in your library, which mean, it means it won't go to anything below that um, because it's the last item. Um, right. And you can actually drag other items from different categories in your library into that visual category. So what I've done is I've put, I have my photo guide overview first, doesn't really matter, Bible Times Photo Museum uh, second. And then I grabbed um, a resource from Erdman's called All the People in the Bible from the dictionary, I think, category and placed mm -hmm. it third. And it has a lot of the links um, that the photo museum might not have. So if it doesn't have it in the photo museum and you hover over an item, it'll show the information from all the people in the Bible or whatever resource you choose um, in the instant details. So, so just a little tip there that might help you all out. That yeah, is a that's, great, great. that's a great tip. Uh, this was when you were talking about the Egyptian gods. Uh, are the descriptions of the gods listed, for example, on the last one of Ra versus Horus, is there a way to know um, know that looking at the picture if you don't know? Um, yes, so I'll, um, the captions, you know, I try to identify um, everything as, as much as possible um, for you. So, um, <clears throat> so we go to, you know, solar deities, um, I'll talk about each one and then, you know, for that one that had the, the various, um, the various solar deities, uh, Ray appears at left with the head of a falcon topped with a sun disc and cobra. The god with the scarab within the sun disc is Kepri, the manifestation of Ray at dawn. The ram-headed god at right represents the nightly manifestation of Ray as he traveled through the underworld. So, so yeah, I, you know, um, as much as I can identify it. So like this, this one figure here, um, I couldn't figure out who this was. Um, it may be Osiris, um, but I don't see the, the hieroglyph for Osiris. And again, I'm still kind of an, an amateur. Um, his name is probably here, but I could, I couldn't really, um, make that out. It's probably Atum um, is what I'm guessing, um, who is another uh, another solar deity. Um, but, you know, if I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't say, I just said, uh, this is Ray, this is Kepri, this is, um, this is Ray at night. All right. Um, we have a question here, and I'm not sure that I understand it. So, Bert, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, and you can give clarification, but it asks: Are the issues that David that the issues that David raises addressed in the article, or just why he was studying it? I'm not quite sure I understand that question. Bert, do you want to clarify I'll be that? Glad, David, I really appreciated all the things when you were going through Egypt. You were talking many times about things that you were gleaning, the questions you were asking uh -huh. yourself. My question was. Were those questions that you were talking about actually addressed in the article, or are those just things that you're popping up and talking about in this webinar that are still open issues that we're not going to find by buying the by buying the resource? No, I uh, most of what I've, I've mentioned um, I I talk about in the in the photo museum. So, you know, if it was, um, but, I mean, I. Like you were talking yeah, about the Christian and Jewish symbols, both on that epithet, and that this was that, and something else was here. And I was just curious because you raised. I wonder if they were believers or they were. It was on faith and it was on peace, and you raised right, a bunch right. of. Different. I didn't know if that was addressed in the article or whether that was just something you were gleaning and commenting on. Yes, yes, that's addressed in the article. So. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I you know I I tried to to make this as give as as much text explanation as possible. I, um, there's, you know, if if it's any, if it was anything that was um, uh, that I I felt like was biblically relevant, I I tried to include it in in my descriptions. So. All right, um, and you'll see um, you'll see some pretty detailed captions of things like um, you know we did 
Um, well, here's a fun one. Um, let's do uh, Tutankhamun. And, um, you know, we had, we had Tutankhamun um, in the photo guide or photo museum too, but, um, sorry, Tutankhamun. Um, but we've gotten a lot more pictures and, and so I've, I've greatly expanded this with lots, lots more photographs. And, um, and I talked before about how, you know, one of the obvious things that you talk about is the change in name. You know, he was Akhenaten's son and he was born Tutankhaten, a name which means living image of Aten. But um, he changed his name to um, Tutankhamun, um, which is living image of Amun. And uh, I actually go through, uh, you've got his cartouche here, and, um, and it'll talk about how uh, these, um, these three symbols here with the sun disk, that's the name Aten. And then and the God's name is always put first, no matter whether it was pronounced that way or not. And then the um, this with the chick and the, the two little, these are supposed to be loaves of bread. That's the toot. And then you have the ankh um, here. So this is toot ankh aten. And then if we go to the next, um, the next image, this is the cartouche of toot ankh amen. And uh, so here's... The, Pardon? And he's got a checkerboard. He does have a checkerboard. Um, this is um, the character MN. And uh, so you've got Toot, Ankh, um, Imun, um, which is the name Amun. And uh, one of the things that's kind of weird about hieroglyphs is just um, uh, this. I, okay, so this is not documented. I don't think I'd talk about this. But uh, so this is extra. But. Um, it will use characters that represent two characters, like um, this character represents MN, but then this character represents N, and it's not MNN, it's not two Ns, it's just this character is sort of repeating and helping you to identify what this character is. It, it's it's a, a strange, you know, um, system of writing, but, uh, but anyway, um, that, that's, that's a little bonus. I, I don't know if I talk about that in the in the photo museum, but I do in writing, um, in the article on writing, I do talk about some of the distinctions of um, hieroglyphics. Uh, so when we get to Egypt, Egyptian hieroglyphs, this will talk about, um, for instance, the Merneptah stela. Um, this is the name um, Israel. Um, so um it's here this is israel uh, through here and then you see um a figure of a person and then a seated figure of a woman so this is a, a man and a woman and this is the determinative sorry sorry about my phone ringing um but this is the determinative that indicates that israel is a people group it's a group of people if you look at some of these other hieroglyphs, and uh, there aren't any shown here, but um, if we look at the, I don't know if you'll be able to see because this is further back, but most of the other place names that are mentioned use a different determinative, which shows three hills. Mm -hmm. And um, and so those place names are actually place names, but the name Israel is not a place name, it's a people name. So by Merneptah's time, the people of Israel are still sort of sojourning in the in the land and, you know, are not really an established state with their own king. And so don't have the uh, the hill um, determinative symbol. So um, so there's there's all kinds of neat stuff like that. And then um, and you can see these are long captions. Um, I'm talking about the direction of, of hieroglyphs and then. Um, this one talks about the the um, the priority of the god's name in a cartouche. So this is Jed F. Ray, um, but depending on how you read it, 
um, does Ray come last or does it come first? Um, it comes first in the cartouche. So that's how you end up with these pharaohs with, with names that seem very different. Well, it's Ray J. Def or J. Def Ray, depending on whether you read Ray first or last. So anyway, I, I try to um, share some of that, um, some of that information. Well, I'm, I'm just very impressed that you can read these hieroglyphs. Uh, two more questions. And one of them I'm going to answer. Um, uh, Robert Noel asks, what about dates for the artifacts and images? Um, yeah, so if if there is a, you know, if the date is known, um, then it's included in the caption usually. Um, uh, sometimes that, you know, sometimes the dates are going to be, well, this is seventh century. Sometimes they're, they're more specific. Uh, David, I think we've lost audio. Uh, the product page for the photo museum, and the quickest way I could tell you right now, just verbally, is if you if you go to our website, accordancebible.com, and you click on the the sale link on the the home page for autumn time sale or something like that, um, you'll find the photo museum at the top go to that product page by clicking on the link. And if you are signed in with your account to our, uh, to, to your uh, account, if you're signed in to your account, it will show you your upgrade price. So if you have. Right. So like this seal, um, I was talking about the seal of Jezebel. Um, it has the name Jezebel on it. Um, so if it's authentic, you know, we would date it to the reign of Jezebel, but because it was unprovenanced, um, and just showed up on the antiquities market or or, uh, or in a site and it was hard to figure out, you know, um, where it came from. Um, there, I don't give a date. So it's just, it just depends on the artifact and uh, whether the date is known or not. So sometimes, you know, these are, these seals are interesting because they illustrate, they attest to certain names, um, but, uh, you know, so, under the prophet Nathan, I have a seal that that has the name of a Nathan. Now it's probably not the Nathan of of David's time, but uh, but it attests to the name. So, all right. Well, thank you very much, David. This has been fascinating, and uh, sir.